So in the Bhagavad Gita, we are studying the fourth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. The big question, the grand question here was that not only how to become spiritual, how to become enlightened, how to realize God, but how does it impact our lives? How do we manifest that spirituality in our day-to-day -day lives? How do you combine your uh, daily life with your spirituality? Uh, so that is that is the um, big question. And that synthesis is done by Sri Krishna. He gives that remarkable verse, very paradoxical language, where he shows us the secret of action, seeing action in inaction and inaction in action. So that verse shows us the very heart of Advaita Vedanta as applied to our our karma, our, our work, work a day life. And that section culminated in the grand vision, Brahma Arpanam Brahma Havi, of the experience of Brahman everywhere, in the midst of all activity. It is not that spirituality and our, our daily lives are divorced, that there is a, something else called spiritual and something else called secular, but it's actually the spiritualization of what we call our secular lives. Uh, so that's it. Now, after that, Sri Krishna has been giving us a series of spiritual practices, 12. And he has been telling us about these spiritual practices in a special way, using the language of Yajna. Yajna is a term which means the Vedic fire sacrifice, the kind of ritual that people at that time were familiar with. So Sri Krishna uses that language. And uh, in fact, the highest Advaitic teaching, Brahmaharpanam Brahmahavi, that was taught in the, with the, in the format of a yajna. Uh, no, Brahman is the offering, Brahman is the ladle by which you make the offering, the fire is Brahman. He's drawing the picture of a Vedic ritual, but he does not mean the Vedic ritual itself. What he means is, uh, how do you uh, manifest your non-dual realization in day-to-day -day life, in, in, active, in the midst of activity. Um, so, after that, he has given a list of several spiritual practices, several um, disciplines, which are preparatory. In fact, 12, uh, we counted 12 last time, including, the, of course, the highest one, the final one, which gives us enlightenment, that Brahmarpanam, that one, but all the others also, 11 others, uh, which uh, uh, are all explained in terms of yajna, by drawing the picture of a Vedic fire sacrifice. But they are practices any religious person, any spiritual person is familiar with. You know, um, discipline of the body and mind, or fasting, or um, uh, pranayama, or yoga, whatever. All kinds of practices. Now, in verse number 30. You know, in verse number 30. So, the last one he's mentioning... Apare niyatahara pranan praneshu juhati sarve pyete yajna vidho yajna kshapita kalmasha. I think we touched upon this last time. The final one of these practices was control of food, an important practice. Um, what we eat and uh, um, how much we eat, not just the quantity but the, the quality, the nature of the food that we eat. So, um, so, he says here, niyata ahara, they have a discipline about food, or what they eat. Uh, pranan prani shujuhati, the five pranas, the physiological functions of the body, the physiological forces which keep this body alive, uh, the prana, apana, vyana, udana, samana. I'm not going into any of the details. It's usually the, the people who practice hatha yoga and more so those who know about Ayurveda, they know much more about these pranas. But the basic idea is balancing the prana so that they are healthy in their functioning. Too much eating and eating the wrong things, uh, re eating at, ro uh, at uh, wrong times, at any time at all, snacking, what it does is uh, it disturbs these pranas, the activities of these pranas. It keeps them constantly active and damages their functioning with the consequent bad effects on the health. And the health of the body has a direct effect on the mind. If the body is sick, if the body is, uh, um, you know, you're feeling bloated or you've, you've got, uh, uh, you know, acid reflux or whatever, all kinds of digestive problems and issues, immediately there's an effect on the mind. And spirituality, spiritual practices 
like prayer or meditation or even uh, you know deep thinking becomes very difficult so regulated food um, the time when we eat the quantity of food and what we eat these are to be uh, regulated and um, this is a big subject in itself but you notice i have seen so many uh, spiritual practitioners especially those who practice yoga meditation the path of meditation they have to be very careful about their food so that the body does not disturb the mind um i have seen in the monastery so first of all there's a discipline about food in the monastery that whatever is cooked and offered in the monastery that's what you're going to eat you don't have a choice there that's one discipline we have um then you have a choice about the quantity you can your choice is of course there you you can choose not to eat that's that's the choice you have uh so there are monks i've seen who um do not do they have one meal a day uh, they many monks who do not eat at night for example um there are um, one of the disciplines is to become vegetarian in fact in this country i i discovered that people go further than the yogis in india there's this whole vegan diet thing which has come which is pretty strict actually so that's one kind of control of the items which you eat um then there are i know of much more severe things you know that to in order to control the taste so it's not so much about health uh, the, to control the desire for tasty food so they take only very bland food or i had heard of this um, yogi in the himalayas is swami who would get all his the food which he got not too tasty to begin with and then he would wash it all in, in ganges water so <laughs> it would be a soggy mess and completely uh, almost unpalatable unpa- uh, and that's what he would eat so that there is absolutely no t- question of taste involved but anyway don't make a fetish out of it but whatever keeps your body light and healthy whatever promotes um, you know lightness of the body and uh, so that the body doesn't remind you that it's there <laughs> it it wants something all the time or it's feeling sick it's pulling the mind down to itself that is a good diet sarve pete yogya vido all of these all of whom all the two, the ones who practice all these 12 practices remember it's not that you have to practice these 12 practices there are many many spiritual practices many many religious practices only a few have been mentioned here so it's not that you have to practice all of them if you, if one practices a few of them that's good enough the purpose of all all of it is yagya kshapita kalpakarmasha kalmasha means impurity dirt the conditionings of the mind uh, which make it difficult to go ahead in spiritual life the strong pull towards the world um, you know uh, desires and uh, jealousies and uh, uh, little bits of uh, anger and irritation and negativities all of which are in the mind and uh, they root us to this material existence those are purified by these spiritual practices um, among them one of course is primary which is that one gyana yagya we have that uh, brahmaharpanam the practice or the insight which allows you to see brahman in every experience especially with in inactive life also you see brahman everywhere that is the highest but all the others whether it is pranayama or fasting or control of the senses or control of food so many things the vows observing vows many many and many more which have not been mentioned here japa is a practice japa yagya krishna has not mentioned here but he'll mention in a chapter later on another very wonderful practice repeating the holy name of god so all of these practices yagya kshapita kalmasha by practices of by these various spiritual practices the goal is only one thing is to purify the mind the goal is to purify the mind which is necessary for making vedanta effective without this vedanta will not be effective then number 31 yagya sheshtam rito bhujo yanti brahma sanatanam nayam loko astya yagyasya kutonya kurusattama this is verse number 
eating of ambroisal food after the sacrifice, they attain the eternal Brahman. Even this world is not for the non-sacrificing, much less the other or best of the Kurus, Arjuna. So literally, the translation is literal translation. The literal meaning is, when one performs a Vedic ritual, the food which is offered is, is taken afterwards, and that, he says, that is like nectar. A corresponding thing would be, uh, in modern Hinduism, would be prasad. So food is offered to the deity, whichever form of Hinduism you practice. And among the offerings in, in the ritual, the ritualistic worship of the deity is called puja. In the puja, there are food offerings. And um, obviously the deity doesn't gobble up all the food, so the food is all left over and it is distributed among us, the devotees. And so we enjoy that delicious food. So the food that is offered to the deity, uh, that is called prasada. So those who eat that prasada, they, uh, they will attain to the highest spirituality. That's the literal meaning. The food offered uh, in the ritual and the left, the, which, is, which is consumed later on by the devotees. So those who live on that food, they attain to the highest. But what does it actually mean? It means that those who live a life of um, moral, ethical and religious discipline, they will attain the highest. How did I get this meaning? Yajna Shishta, the, that which is pervaded by or purified by Yajna, that kind of life, when you live that kind of life, Yajna, all these practices, all the 12 practices we have mentioned, especially the 11 moral, ethical practices, which are meant to discipline the body and mind, to bring it under control, to purify it and keep it, make it ready for the higher spirituality. Those who live a life of moral, ethical and religious discipline, they are fit for enlightenment. Yanti Brahma Sanatanam. They attain to the eternal Brahman. They will realize Aham Brahmasmi and they will be enlightened. They will get moksha, freedom. So, here it is. Often, there is a feeling that Advaita Vedanta is that you have these uh, higher spiritual practices. You, you study the Upanishads and you are told you are Brahman. And you think well upon it and maybe you, uh, you meditate a little bit and then you are enlightened. And that's it. That's all that you have to do. It's instantaneous, eff almost effortless. And you realize, Aham Brahma, I am Brahman and the thing is finished, done with. Not so fast. It never ever happens that way. So the misunderstanding is that Advaita Vedanta is somehow this um, almost miraculous, very sophisticated, very... Uh, rarefied spiritual path, uh, you know, the highest, uh, a, a kind of extraordinary magical insight by which all our problems will be solved and you don't need to do anything else. No, that's a misunderstanding. That's a misunderstanding. All the so-called spiritual practices which you find in religion, uh, traditional religion, the religion which you see in temples and churches and mosques and all, they are all very useful for Advaita Vedanta. Advaita Vedanta just says that those are not the ultimate things. Uh, those prepare you. But without that, it won't work. Without the Advaitic realization, non-dual realization, what realization? I am Brahman. The, all the other religious practices, the rituals, the vows, the austerities, they do not attain their ultimate purpose. The ultimate purpose is enlightenment. But without those other practices, this enlightenment cannot be attained. Just by reading a couple of books and just by attending a couple of classes, one won't. What will happen is, um, what you will end up with a feeling of either, number one, I don't get it. What are they talking about? I've, I've had this reaction. I'm not, I have no idea what they're talking about. Or, I have no interest in this. It doesn't sound at all interesting. Why would you spend time with, with this incomprehensible stuff from some ancient book? What's happening here? What's happening is the layer of worldly dirt is so much. The, um, you know, the world seems the only reality that is. 
money and pleasure seeking and power and glamour and achievement that seems to be the only reality that is i'm reminded of once sri ramakrishna saw some old gentlemen sitting together in the daytime retired from their job these old gentlemen sitting and playing cards now nowadays i guess they would be stuck to their screens or something but they were playing cards and sri ramakrishna says to them my goodness isn't hasn't the time to call on god come yet you know old you're going to die in a few days the life of the world is over for you it's done isn't isn't it high time that you start calling on god that you take up spiritual practices see it doesn't the interest doesn't come it doesn't even seem to be anything of interesting uh, any, the world seems interesting the world seems real no matter how full of suffering and misery how many kicks and blows i've got from it it's because of the impurity of the mind or i'm interested but when i come to this i don't understand what is this brahman consciousness mind and the uh, inquiry it what if what is called what's all this going on that's also because a certain dull this a person may be very smart with other things you know academically smart or smart in the in business or whatever or very clever in in worldly dealings but may not at all get what's going on here in this higher spirituality that's also because of the impurity of the mind or none of us here are like that that's because you are here continuously day after day month after month year after year you're pursuing spirituality but in our case what happens is we are interested and we get it also but without sufficient preparation we'll end up with i get what you are saying but it's not working it still still seems to be something philosophical something speculative something intellectual a clever philosophy that's what it seems to be uh, what about transforming my life what was promised you will overcome suffering you will attain fulfillment that doesn't seem to be happening so even this is because of lack of preparation so we need these practices that's why it says those who uh, live a life conditioned or, or life with these disciplines amrita bhujad it's as if they are um, enjoying nectar uh, they are living a life of amrita means the nectar of the gods so that kind of life and they alone are fit for uh, realizing brahman or becoming enlightened god realization what about the uh, opposite those who don't practice these things why wouldn't somebody practice uh, spiritual disciplines there are so many reasons not interested or you know why should i practice r- the disciplines rituals rules rigid things you know uh, my freedom i am free this is a, this is a new kind of superstition of the modern age uh, it's uh, impacting my freedom i'll do i am a free person i'll do what i want why should i follow all these rules you know eat this don't eat that i'll eat whatever i want get up at this time why it's too cold it's too early i'll sleep in so um this is not freedom this is an unfortunate under, uh, misunderstanding of the word freedom what is freedom that i decide to get up early in the morning and then do meditation or yoga or whatever and my body obeys me my mind obeys me day after day i can do it is that freedom or i decide to get up early in the morning and then some days it's too cold or some days i don't feel good enough some days i am not interested uh some days uh, you know i'm too tired and i don't do it and i don't follow it who, who is free who is free doing whatever the mind wants me to do is that freedom that seems to be freedom because we are so deeply connected with the mind mind's desire i want no not you want you have been deluded hypnotized the wants are preprogrammed in the mind they are bubbling up in the mind i want this i want to see this i want to touch that i want to smell this i, I want to go there i want to see, um, you know enjoy this uh, all of these are bubbling up in the mind quite mechanically and we get identified with these movements of the mind and say i want it and if anything frustrates it anything anybody stops me we get angry yeah. when desire is frustrated the result is anger kama krodho abhijayate in second chapter krishna told us then when desire is blocked it's transformed into anger why because we think it is my desire you are impacting my freedom notice i myself decide 
I will get up at this time. I will follow this diet. And I myself am unable to follow it. Is that freedom? That's not freedom. It's slavery to the body-mind. That um, saying, um, Kinkarasya kinkari, kinkari krito aham, ahaha. Alas, by the servant of my servants, I have been made a servant. Who is, the, who is my servant? I am the self. My servant is the mind. Who is the servant of the mind? The senses, sense organs. By the servant of my servants, my mind servants are the sense organs. By those sense organs, I, the Atman, the Lord of this entire body-mind system, I have been made a servant. Now I am serving, serving the sense organs. Whatever the sense organs want, pleasant sights, pleasant tastes, pleasant smell, touch, I am running around to get that. So, that is not freedom. These disciplines, where we consciously restrict the activities of our body-mind, seeing, eating, touching, talking, we restrict it. This is gaining uh, control over our body-mind system. That is freedom. So, in the next line, Krishna says, he criticizes those who do not follow discipline of body and mind. Nayam lokavasti, ayagyasya. Those who do not practice yajna, ayagya. Again remember, yajna here, I am repeating this ad nauseum, it does not mean the Vedic fire sacrifice here, just, just the ritual. It means um, the spiritual practices which are being described as yajna. So those who do not follow these practices, these 12 or anything else, many other kinds of practices are there. Those who do not follow some kind of ethical practice, Nayam loko asti. Kuto anya. Even this world, they will not succeed in this world. They will not be happy in this world. What to speak about the other? Other means it could be heaven after death or it could be enlightenment, the spiritual realization. One will not be happy in this world itself. Without restraint, without discipline, nothing can be achieved in this world. Um, Daniel Goleman, uh, he, he popularized the term EQ, emotional intelligence. Uh, he's a Harvard trained psychologist, very well known uh, science writer, especially about psychology. So you can find, you must have read his book, many of you, Emotional Intelligence. He popularized the term. He saw that intelligence measured by IQ is not a good predictor of success in the world. Um, people, it might be a good predictor of success in, in school or college. With excellent academic grade, grades, people go into the world and often are seen to be failures. They, they stumble and they fail in professional life, in their private lives, in their families. So what is a better predictor of success? Who can be successful, happy in this world? So he formulated his idea or conception of emotional intelligence. Um, and the first component in that emotional intelligence, he mentions five components. The first component is this one. Um, self-regulation. The first component is self-regulation. The ability to, to, he says very precisely, to postpone gratification. I want something right now. And I have the ability to say that no. Let me not go out to that party. Let me not watch that movie. Let me do my assignment. And then maybe I'll enjoy myself later. Or let me work hard right now and be frugal and I can earn a lot of money, I can enjoy myself more later. Very worldly goal, but even that requires restraint. So we know, whether it's in college or in a job or in a family, it's the person who, is, who has personal discipline, who has certain core values and follows them systematically, that person is usually more successful. So the first component of emotional intelligence is self-regulation, the ability to postpone gratification. And I gave a talk about this a long time back, I think nearly 10 years back, in IIT Kanpur. Uh, I showed that cute video, you'll find it on, on YouTube, the marshmallow test. The marshmallow test for little kids is a very famous psychology experiment conducted by Walter Mischel um, in the 1960s, I think at Yale probably, uh, or some other Ivy League university. Uh, he... He selected, he, he got some little kids, four-year-olds. And the experiment was the psychologist will offer the four-year-old 
boy or girl a marshmallow so when i talked about this in india i didn't even know what a marshmallow was i'd never seen a marshmallow so i just thought it's like an indian sweet or something then after coming to the united states i saw what a marshmallow is so the, the psychologist offers the kid a marshmallow do you want it and the kid obviously says yes and so then then the experimenter says look i'll um, i'm going out i've got some work i'll come back in a few minutes if you don't eat the marshmallow if it's still there i'll give you one more then you can have two marshmallows do you want two instead of just the one you can have the one right now if you eat it now i won't give you the second one but if you don't eat it and wait for me i'll give you the second one you can eat two marshmallows then do you want two marshmallows and every kid said yes that's the interesting thing they all said yes we want two then the condition is just wait for a few minutes remember these are four year olds so waiting for 10 minutes is also an eternity for them and uh, so they left they were under observation uh, uh, and uh, later this very famous psychologist zimbardo philip zimbardo he repeated the whole experiment so what you find on youtube is the video recording of the the new experiment the re- repeated experiment not walter michel's old one i don't think those were video recorded in the new experiment if you look at it the marshmallow test zimbardo marshmallow test uh, you will see they are being secretly video recorded the children and you can see the kids some of them are looking out towards the door when will he come back and some are looking greedily at the plate uh, the marshmallow uh, some uh, some can't resist it the moment the psychologist re- leaves the room uh, some pick it up and eat it or some resist it for some time and they look around and then it's too much then they eat it but there are others who resist it resist the temptation to eat the marshmallow and they wait until the psychologist comes back and then they get a second marshmallow now what walter michel did was uh, he kept track of these kids the ones who were able to wait who all of them said we will wait but the ones who were able to wait the ones who were not able to wait and he didn't tell them anything of course 14 years later he went back to them and so these kids were 18 years they were just going out of school into college and he he went through their school records he talked to the parents to the teachers to their friends and he found amazing extraordinarily significant differences between the two groups he found those who were able to restrain themselves at the age of 4 in this simple experiment they did better across the board better at at uh, academics better in sports be- better in anything that required effort um, better at you know extracurricular activities like music and things like that in they worked better in teams they were better liked the other kids were more seen as more impulsive less reliable um, irresponsible this is just in school but you can already see that this the difference between the two groups one group is set on the track to succeed better i mean more likely to succeed in life anyhow the whole idea is the ability to restrain my, oneself to restrain one's body and mind body mind and senses is a formula for success in this world as sri krishna says why only um, forget spirituality forget god realization this world itself we will, one cannot enjoy one cannot be successful unless one has a disciplined uh, ethical and moral life kutovanya what to speak of spirituality uh, then number 32 evam bahuvidha yagya vitata brahmano mukhe कर्मजान विद्धितान सर्वान एवं ज्ञात्वा विमोक्षसे दस वेरियस सैक्रिफाइसेस आर प्रिस्क्राइब्ड बाय द वेदस नो ऑल दीस टू बी बोर्न ऑफ एक्शन नोइंग दस यू विल बी फ्री सो ही समराइजेस द होल होल सेक्शन एवं इन दिस मैनर व्हिच मैनर व्हाट हैज जस्ट बीन सेड अ होल लिस्ट ऑफ वेरियस काइंड्स ऑफ प्रैक्टिसेस 12 एक्चुअली bahuvida many and indeed many more than what have just been mentioned every religion has so many of these practices often they are understood as this is religion god has said you do this observe observe this bow now put on this kind of dress 
go to church or temple or mosque or synagogue at this time, uh, recite these things. Um, so a kind of discipline across life. You will notice one common thing in all of them. They are all meant to uh, bring, to, to circumscribe our activities in the world. I want to eat everything. No. These are the things you can eat. These are the ones you cannot eat. And at special times, you know, for example, now there is this thing leading up to Christmas. So there are uh, special activities and, and uh, restrictions and vows at each stage. Every religion has this. Christianity has it. Judaism has the most of it. Maximum, I think. Uh, Islam has it. Hinduism has an extraordinary variety. So has uh, Buddhism. Jainism is very, very strict. So all of these, these are meant for something. Somebody asked me once, a young man, he said, um, look, it's confusing. Which is a holy day? Muslims say Friday and uh, Christians say Sunday and the Jews say Saturday and the Hindus say just about every other day. <laughs> Which is a holy day? <laughs> it's all contradictory. Probably it's all wrong. No, you are mistaking the point of it. It's not that one particular day is more holy than the other. You are supposed to be immersed in God consciousness all the time. You know, Brahma, Arpanam, Brahma, Havi. That is not possible, simply not possible for most of us at this point. So, mark off a certain time, a particular day in the week as a holy day, where you did dedicate at least some time exclusively to spiritual practice, prayer, meditation. Concentrate on God, not on the world. So, the Muslims do it on Friday. Uh, the um, Christians do it on Sunday, the Jews observe the Shabbat and Saturday is holy, especially so for observances. The Shaivites in Hinduism, Monday is the day of Shiva, Tuesday is the day, day, day of the Divine Mother, so is Saturday and so on. It's not that one is particularly, one is right and the other is wrong. Rather, when you take up a particular system, there will be certain prescriptions and all of those prescriptions are good. They help to bring uh, about this discipline of body and mind, leading to purification of body and mind, leading to qualification for non-dual enlightenment. Bahuvida yagya, many, many forms, not only in Vedanta, I mean in Hinduism, or, uh, but also in every religion. Yagya vitata brahmano mukhe. Here, Brahman means Veda. It, it does not mean uh, the ultimate reality. It means Veda. One of the meanings of Brahman is actually Veda. So, in Brahman, Brahman Amukhi literally means in the mouth of Brahman. What it means is in the texts of the Vedas, many such prescriptions are there. So, you can take it in a more general sense, not just the Vedas. In the scriptures, in other Hindu scriptures, in other uh, scriptures of all religions, you will notice the common form of all of those practices is a kind of restriction. I have no particular diet. I can eat anything and everything. No. Here is your particular diet. If you are following, if you are a Muslim, this is your diet. If you are a Buddhist or something. I have uh, no particular routine. Every day is a new day for me. Today I can get up at 4 a.m. Tomorrow I can get up at 10 a.m. No. You have to rise before sunrise. So this is a kind of restriction. And if you do not understand the meaning of these restrictions, and there are many, many such restrictions. All of these disciplines are a kind of restriction on our activity. If we do not understand it, we will rebel against it. Why? The why is it, it is a conscious decision to bring my body and mind, my life under control. That's why. Karma Jan Viditan Sarvan. All of them are part of Karma Yoga. All of them except that Brahma Arpanam Brahma Havi. The rest are all activities dealing with the world, the body and the mind where we bring some, some order and discipline into our daily life as a preparation for spirituality. The Brahma Arpana Brahma Havi, that, that one, 24th verse, that's not a karma. That's a spiritual insight. And the realization that it is Brahman, the whole, whatever I experience is Brahman, whatever I do is Brahman, the people around me are Brahman, the absolute reality. I am Brahman and we are one uh, divine reality. This is an insight. Yeah, so that's not an action. But everything else is an action. Karma Jan Viddhi, Sarvan. It also means these have because these are actions, these have to be performed. 
it's not enough to read about them. I have memorized all the different kinds of yajnas mentioned by Krishna. So, no good. Nothing at all will, have, will come of it unless we do a little bit of it. This is where Swami Vivekananda said, an ounce of practice is worth 20 tons of tall talk. An ounce of practice is worth 20 tons of tall talk. So, all of this, including, say, for example, yoga, Patanjali yoga, uh, you have to do it. It's not enough to read the Yoga Sutras. Uh, it's not enough to read multiple commentaries on the Yoga Sutras. Um, you have actually got to sit down and lock your body in an asana and then concentrate your mind in a particular way, breathe in a particular way. And so, all, all those things have to be done. Here also, the 12 practices, among them the 11 ones, the preparatory ones, they have to be done. Again, not all of them. Whatever uh, suits you. Why are there so many? Okay. Why are there so many? This is an insight that comes. It's a very peculiarly Indian insight. Otherwise, what happens in the Middle Eastern religions is there are these practices because God said so. Or our prophet said so. Our uh, founder of the religion said so. And that's it. These are holy and you have to, these are commandments. That's one way of doing it. The other way is to see that these are particular disciplines which help me. So there can be many of them. Um, they, they can all be alternative. But you must have a set. Why so many? Because we are varied. Uh, some of us can do some of these disciplines. Some of us cannot. Some can fast and that helps them to concentrate on God. Some if they fast they all only think of food. When, when am I going to eat again? Uh, some uh, are very talkative by nature. A vow of silence will be useful for them. Some hardly speak, so the vow of silence doesn't do much, make much difference to them. Um, so all, all of these practices, some are suitable for us, some are of special benefit to us at some point in our life. That's why you have a variety of practices. They all must help us in getting control of the body, mind and senses and purifying the mind. And then, evam gyatva vimoksha se, knowing these, you will be freed, you will, you will attain moksha. Knowing these means, practicing these, gaining fitness for Vedanta and by getting the Vedantic realization, aham brahmasmi, you will get moksha. Notice one thing, you must have noticed already throughout the months that I am putting a Vedantic overlay on the original text of the Gita, the Advaitic overlay, non-dual interpretation. So mostly what I am saying is a non-dualistic interpretation. If you hear the same Gita taught from a, uh, I'll say a Vaishnava Acharya, uh, from a dualist perspective, so the spin will be a little different. It's a good exercise to see the original text and then look at it through the lens of a particular school. So I am talking not from a strictly non-dualist school because I bring in insights from other, other um, teachers also. For example, sometimes I bring in insights from Swami Ramsuk Dasji who was a Vishishta Advaitin, qualified monist. Then, oh there is so much activity on the chat. Let me quickly look at the chat and then we will go to the next verse. Prabhir Vasu says, like Karma Yoga, here also for the Yajnas looks like the motive of the Yajna is important. Absolutely. In fact, these Yajnas are Karma Yoga. This is an interesting insight. The Karma Yoga is meant for uh, purifying the mind. Preparation for um, Jnana Yoga. Again, in the classical structure of Shankaracharya. Shankaracharya says Karma Yoga, then Upasana, Bhakti and Dhyana, and then Jnana Yoga. And Karma Yoga purifies, makes you ready. These are all actually Karma Yoga. This is another way of looking, of describing Karma Yoga. Prabhupada Basu says, this seems to have connection to Sadhana Chattishtha. Absolutely. Absolutely. The whole purpose of all these yajnas, all these practices, is to make us fit for Vedantic uh, illumination. What is fitness? Is it fitness, or define fitness, possession of the four qualities. The fourfold qualities for a Vedantic seeker. Um, 
Viveka, the discernment between the eternal and non-eternal. Vairagya, dispassion for the non-eternal. Uh, the six treasures, so it's a little bit of cheating. The six have been packed into one. So there are a total of nine qualifications. The six treasures and the last one would be intense desire for freedom. Those will arise when we have such a lifestyle. This is an interesting thing. I have no particular desire. I'm interested in spirituality, but I don't have that intense desire for um, God realization. Am I leading a disciplined, ethical, moral life, regular in my spiritual practices? Then that intense desire for enlightenment will come in time. So that arises from these practices. Again, not just these 12, it could be many others, whatever it is. So what am I doing right now? Something has to be done. Uh, some set of spiritual practices. So in our order, for example, uh, we uh, there's, there's a mantra diksha, initiation into a mantra. There's an Ishta Devata who's given. Guru gives you that, teaches you how to meditate. So two times or three times a day, we sit down and we withdraw from the world, meditate on the Ishta Devata, repeat the mantra as much as we can. That's our upasana, meditative practice. But then there are um, all the work in our day-to-day -day life, in the in the in our religious activities and our so-called secular activities. We all do it as karma yoga, trying to see that it is the worship of Sri Ramakrishna or our Ishta Devata. Um, we practice the fundamental um, uh, moral values, truth and non-violence and self-control and so on. So this is a set of practices. And this leads to Sadhana Chatushta. Licentiousness versus freedom, yes. So freedom is actually freedom from waywardness. Chinmanindra says, not to do what you feel like doing is freedom. <laughs> it's Chinmaswami Chinmayananda, yes. Uh, when you feel like doing uh, good things like meditation and study and all, that is good. One should do that. But one, when it is not part of your program, you have made up your mind that I am a spiritual seeker and the impulses which are arising in my mind are not part of that at all. They are not taking me towards God. Then the ability to not do that, to stop myself from doing things which will take me away from God. And the ability to do things which will take me towards God, even if there is no particular desire arising for that in the mind. This is true freedom. Eric from the well-known psychoanalyst distinguishes freedom from and freedom to correct. Freedom from certain things and the freedom to do certain things. Instead of austerity, is discipline and moderation acceptable? Gabriel is asking. Absolutely. In fact, discipline and moderation is the right austerity. That was Bhagavan Buddha's insight. The too much intensity of fasting and um, a very austere and minimal lifestyle may be in the long run not very good for spiritual life. Remember, spiritual quest is a marathon. It will take years and decades and decades. Most of our life, maybe lifetimes. It's not a sprint. If you exhaust yourself in tremendous austerities for a few weeks or months and then health is damaged, uh, mind, uh, you know, so it, it affects the mind and it will ultimately damage our spiritual life. Moderation and discipline is the right, uh, right austerity. That is, it's actually much, much better to be moderate and disciplined throughout lifetime, rather than intensively practicing such something or the other on a whim. I remember, at one time, I was living in the mountains in a. A very austere setup, you know, like uh, begging for my food and living in a, um, a, a log cabin 10,000 feet high in the Himalayas. After a month or two of that, I was very happy. But when I came back to one of our ashrams, also in the Himalayas, one of our monks saw me and he said, You look so haggard. I mean, that's not the exact translation. In Bengali, he said, Ba, besh. The, the, the term Jhodoka, how do I translate it? It means, you know, when there's a storm and the birds, after that you'll see their feathers are ruffled, they look sort of disheveled. <laughs> so, so it's just like a storm-blown crow. Okay, that's the translation. A storm-blown or storm-ruffled crow. 
after a fierce storm uh, the crows if you see they've lost some of their feathers their feathers are all askew and they look sort of stoned <laughs> so he says you look like that it's it's because of overdoing things it's much better to live for example in the ashram for 50 60 years following the routine of the ashram then for suddenly scooting off to the mountains and living on a glacier or something for six weeks <laughs> That might be an adventure, but that's not spiritually mature. I remember, uh, very good, one of the monks whom I really, really respected very much as maybe one of the few I, I feel have are spiritually enlightened, I have seen in my lifetime. So this Swami, Swami Moksha Dhanandaji, he passed away several years ago, Ram Maharaj. Uh, he was a wonderful Swami, right? extraordinarily learned, saintly, um, a beautiful uh, monk. He, when I was a novice, I went to the novices training center in our main monastery. So I went to bow down to him. And I was in, dressed in white as a novice, Brahmachari. He asked me, so what are you here for? I said, I'm going into training. It's a two-year intensive training uh, course. And there, the um, routine, the schedule is very strictly mapped out there are i counted 26 bells in 24 hours so the first bell it starts with 3 40 a.m getting up and there is no mercy you have to get up then somebody will politely ring a bell in your ear till you do get up at 3 40 a.m and then 26 bells throughout the day the most hated one being at 10 30 in the night which tells you to go to sleep especially if you those for those who are already asleep that's not a nice bell to hear <laughs> so it's a very intense routine. Now, there are two kinds of reactions of the novices. They all come with, with great in, uh, enthusiasm into it. Some want to do much more. You know, we will become enlightened, like the Buddha. So, I have got these two years of intensive spiritual practice. And definitely, I'm going to be enlightened by the end of the two years. I'm going to see God or become get moksha or something like that. And they tend to overdo things more than what is required. And there's the opposite reaction. There are a few lazy souls uh, or take it easy kind of souls. They try to do less than what is required. Anyway, so when I bowed down to this monk, Moksha Dhanandaji, and I said, I have come here for two years of training. He said, oh, training center, wonderful. Follow the bell, that's enough. In Bengali he said, Ghanta Shrangi Chorli Habe. Follow the bell, that's enough. You see, the, the schedule has been mapped out for an intense spiritual life. Just do that. Don't be spiritually ambitious. Don't be lazy. That is discipline and moderation. Rick has given us this marshmallow test and a YouTube link also. I think. Uh, is that the link? Yes, that's the link. You're right. Do see it if you have, uh, uh, if you are interested in the marshmallow test. It's very cute. Fanindra says, I have, I read one interpretation of the marshmallow test. It said it is equally about distracting yourself from temptation as it was self-control and willpower. Very close to yogic practice of Pratipaksha Bhavana, thinking of opposing thoughts when bothered by negative thoughts. Absolutely. If you see the kids, some of the kids who were able to resist the marshmallow, uh, you will see they play little games, they occupy themselves with this or that. Uh, naturally. It's not that they are devising a strategy, it's just the way they did it. And they were successful. Now this shows a crucial secret about our minds. Our minds can think about only one thing at a time. Simple secret, but it's a very powerful thing to know. Our minds can think only one thing at a time. And use this for changing your life. Introduce what you want the mind to think of and let the mind stay there. You might say easier said than done. No, we must devise strategies for it. So I want to think about, say I want to think about God. Then just don't say think about God because any other distraction the mind will run there. Do it in such a way, the shrine where you think about God, let there be music, a bhajan or some soulful music playing, the posture, you have taken a bath and you... So make all the preparations so that the mind is conditioned to think about God. It will do that. 
So here it is said, Pratipaksha Bhavana, yogic practice. Think of the opposite. Because the mind can think only one thing, negative thoughts come, replace it with a positive thought. Because the mind will think of only one thing, it can hold on to that one only. And it will again, you see, it will again go back to the negative thought. Maybe depression or anger. Again replace it. Every moment you have a choice of introducing a positive thing. Every moment we have the choice of making a decision. What to think about, what to say and what to do. This is a very good insight. Panindra says, is it accurate to, accurate to say yajna can be understood as karma done with the attitude of tyaga? Correct. In the traditional yajna, indraya swaha. So it means I am offering this to the deity. Na mama, not mine. So our professor Randam Chakravarti, he stresses this aspect very much. Good deal of spirituality is basically this. This me and mine, give that up. And so all spiritual practices, they push towards that, giving up this me and mine. The whole of the uh, yajna, in one of the definitions of the Vedic yajna was dravya tyaga, to offering up the dravya materials. It could be that uh, ghee or anything else, or one's own wealth or whatever it is, you are offering it up to the deity. Um, so that is the essence of the yajna. Correct. And karma yoga is basically abstracted from the concept of yajna. Rekha Kalikar, what would you recommend a spiritual routine for us to follow? I wouldn't recommend a particular spiritual routine for you to follow, but you must. only thing I'll recommend is you must have a routine. One Swami said it very nicely. Some young people asked him, so tell us what to do. Uh, he said, in Hindi I'll translate, Nyuntam se shuru karo, saraltam ka abhyas karo. Start with the smallest and practice the easiest. If we, our main problem is we become very ambitious. I'm used to getting up at 9 o'clock, I'll get up at 4, 4 a.m. And I'll fail. Uh, I'm very miserly about my money, I'll make huge donations. I'll fail. Or if I force myself to do it, I'll become <laughs> miserable. Start with the smallest and practice the easiest. Then you can upgrade, push it up slowly. The smallest and the easiest is something that the mind will say, yes, I have to, I can do it. The mind cannot give any excuse there. If I'm used to getting up at 8 o'clock, get up at 7.45. It can be done. It's not so difficult at all. So that way. It will have every aspect of your life. Is there some aspect of ritualistic worship? Is there some aspect of service in your life? Is there some aspect of um, scriptural study? Is there some aspect of meditation in your life? Plus, all the other aspects of your life. When do I get up? What do I eat? Do I exercise? All of these things should also be there. Routine, you know. Um, I remember this Swami. He has passed on now. He was one of our teachers in when we were novices. The most extraordinary routine I have seen. I wouldn't recommend that. It's, I, I found it a little mechanical. But extraordinary. He never had a moment to spare from early morning till late in the night. Everything was measured by the clock, minute to minute. And like that for 50, 60 years of his life. This is when to get up, this is when to take a bath, this is when to study, this is when to go to the temple. For about 50 years, he never left the gate of Belurmat. Exactly at this time, where he will be, that spot is marked. I mean, he, you can know, this is the time for his walk. This is the time where he'll be in the room. This is the time where he'll, he'll be in the classroom. This is the time he'll be in the temple. This is the time he'll be in the dining room. Nowhere else you'll find him for half a century. Incredible. I saw it with my own eyes. <laughs> I, I found it a bit too much, but anyway. After many decades, that Swami is, uh, I heard a story that many after many decades, some people from his Purvashrama, his relatives from before, before he became a monk, they had come from his native land. So the office of the monastery, they said, please call that Swami, somebody has come to meet him. The Swami couldn't come to meet the, these people who had come from a distant <laughs> place. He couldn't come because he couldn't find any time in his routine to, to go come and meet them. You might think that's crazy, but no, they, that's actually true. And... It's actually, it's the glory of his routine. It, the routine is meant to make him do only things which are related to, his, to God realization, to spirituality, and to prevent him from doing anything else. And it worked.
some of us physical practices certainly um, physical exercise to keep the body fit is important for uh, spiritual life but do this at the beginning at the end of the exercise offer it to god in fact all hatha yoga practices are connected to spirituality some people rick says some people who accomplished a lot like bill gates and elon musk structure their days very carefully yes i found the routines of the top ceos there was an article of um, one thing i noticed they all got up very early 4 4:30 very monastic in their <laughs> approach of course the first thing they did was start answering emails from 4:30 am but very early they took care of their health they always had a lot of energy so they ate lightly and they and they exercised and they structured put a lot of investment into structuring every moment of their day also i was impressed by um gentleman warren buffet who uh, warren buffet he reads 500 pages a day it seems in the top investor and the, one of the quotes i read was that all of you can become uh, all of you can do that he said there's a secret to my uh, success is that i spend bulk of my time reading and he said all of you can do that i also know that all, all of you will not most of you will not do it um, yeah so is routine this compulsory thing not necessarily there will come a time when a person has got what is called ahetu ki bhakti a complete devotion to god completely fallen in love with god no need for a routine for that person when a person has re- god is real for that person there is no chance of that person doing anything else except being centered in god that that person doesn't need a routine there is a story about routine it's good to end with the the other side of the story um swami vivekananda when he set up the monastery in in belur he established a strict routine and the bell the bell which rules the day till till today uh, from early in the morning till late in the night he established that and he said all the monks have to follow this and he immediately saw swami adbhutananda latu maharaj another of the direct disciples of sri ramakrishna who was a radical monk in his own right you know like completely god absorbed he is walking out of the monastery so vivekananda went to catch him where are you going brother he said all these rules you have started i can't abide by them so i'm i'm leaving your monastery then <laughs> swami vivekananda embraced him and said this is not for you this is for the young people who are going to come they need this kind of uh, this uh, protection of these practices you don't need it you you just stay here that's enough um so sri ramakrishna is to say that it is like a fence when you have planted a sapling you put a fence around it otherwise cows and goats will come and eat the sapling but when it grows up he says into a, a banyan tree a big banyan tree it, the fence is not needed anymore and um, you can tie he says you can tie an elephant to it nothing will happen to the tree so the routine is like the fence put around the sapling of spirituality to begin with gabriel has her hand up Yeah. Yes. Just something hello can you yes, hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Just something mundane that happened to me the, the other day how your lectures are seeping into my daily life. Uh remember just a few weeks ago you told us the story about the novice who was walking with the swami and the other novice through a garden and he stopped to smell a flower. Yeah. And uh, the swami lectured him. Mm. So a few days later I got flowers from my friend in Kabul and she works for the UN she has rockets flying and bombs. and she still spent the time sending me beautiful flowers and i was so happy and so touched and i smelled the flowers and then i remembered your story <laughs> and i was so frustrated and angry at that moment because it totally took the joy away because i thought oh these flowers are so beautiful and they smell so nice and every time i had them for a week in the room every time i smelled the flowers and i enjoyed them and i closed my eyes i thought of your story and it's like Now I can't even enjoy the smell of the flowers, and I won't become enlightened. <laughs> no, 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 don't worry about it. Smell the flowers. That's my advice to you. <laughs> don't yeah, worry about the, that. <laughs> your story of the monk was so vivid that yeah. I was like, oh my god. Yeah, it's it's a principle not to be guided by the senses. That's all. 
But if okay. you deliberately, here are the flowers. My friend from Kabul has sent them with so much feeling for me. Of course, I'll smell them and say it's, it's very nice, it's beautiful. That's it. Yeah. Okay. What is the role of entertainment or leisure in this routine? Prabir Basu is saying, uh, it's there actually. Krishna will say it later on. Yuktahara viharascha. Not only balanced food and diet, but also balanced entertainment. Vihara means entertainment. You go for a walk, and you read a book, um, you watch something wholesome. That is also part of, uh, of a balanced, keeping your mind um, you know, relaxed and happy. Yeah. yeah, but if all day one is watching TV serial, then, then it's a problem. I remember, I remember when I became a monk, um, so in the library in the monastery I found this whole set of P.G. Woodhouse. I don't know how many, some of you may have read them. So I used to love that. It's, it's very British humor. Um, but uh, the language is really good. good you, know? you can learn good English by reading that. Now I like that. And when I found the whole set in the, in the library there, I asked one of the monks, can I read it? I'm a, I'm a novice, so can I read uh, P.G. Woodhouse? And he immediately said in Bengali, and he said, Yes, yes, go and read it. Don't worry about these things. Then he said, but if I catch you reading PG Buddha all day long, then there's something seriously wrong. <laughs> yeah, for relaxation, definitely. Why not? Um, but relaxation also, there are different levels to it. I remember this monk um, who is a great scholar of Vedanta. And... Uh, one day in the library, and he's always immersed in reading Shankara's commentaries. So one day in the library in Belurmat, I saw he was reading the Encyclopedia Britannica, one volume. And he looked so embarrassed that I had caught him reading the Encyclopedia Britannica. And he said, oh, just, just for leisure, just for to relax, just to relax. So his relaxation is reading the Encyclopedia Britannica. <laughs> so what is leisure? It also depends on the person. Very good. We'll stop here. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Arpanamastu